Will you pray with me? Father, thank you for all you've done in our lives through this year, through this study. Thank you for the power of your word. Thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit. Thank you that you want us, that you want us to seek you, and it matters to you um, what matters to us, that, that you want to be important to us, that you want us to come to you, that you don't want to be used. And so, Lord, would you take tonight and touch our hearts in a sweet way to just love you as you so desire to be loved by us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Our first set of verses tonight begin with the words, when Jesus heard it. So we should have that question. When, when Jesus heard what? He had just heard of the death of John the Baptist, the murder of not only the one who was called to go before him and proclaim him to Israel, but John was his cousin. He was the one who leapt in his mother's womb recognizing Jesus what did Jesus do upon hearing about the death of John? Did he go, oh, praise the Lord, you know, he's in heaven, everything's fine. No, he departed on a boat with his disciples and went to a deserted place. Jesus had heard about John the Baptist, sad news. But also, he had been hit with some happy news by his disciples. See, they just returned from that great missionary trip. And they were excited, you know, we healed, we cast, it out, we cast out demons. And so Jesus is being hit with sorrow and exhilaration at the same time. And for both of those, you and I need quiet time, away time, rest time, process time. We were created, God purposely created us to sort out things with him. And Jesus gave us that example. See, all too often you and I don't do that. We try to dismiss something that has happened to us or, or tuck it away and fail to sit with the Lord and allow him to comfort us or apply his truth to what we've been exposed to, calm us down. And what's so interesting, and I'm, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. You know, we would all say, yes, alone time with the Lord is always good. So why do we refuse to do it? Why don't we do it? And, and as I thought about that, I, I thought of two reasons, and I thought of a third. And one is we're afraid of what might surface if we still ourselves before the Lord. And then secondly, the enemy of our souls knows how good it is. And whenever he can figure out something that's good for us spiritually, he is out to distract us from it, to give us excuses like, I don't have enough time and maybe another time. And then thirdly, you tried and it didn't do any good. And I know in my life when I try and it doesn't do any good, it's because I walked away too fast. You know, he has told us about prayer to be persistent. And too often we just come and put our request before him and then we walk away. And, you know, have you ever had someone do that with you? And you want to go, well, do you want to know what I think? You know, and, and God is like that too. Do you want me to comfort you? Do you want the things that I can do in your life? And so we walk away too fast. I was reading just in my, my devos today. I've got the wrong reference on this. It should be uh, Jeremiah 56. But he says, my people have forgotten their resting place. And I love that. My people have forgotten their resting place. And forgotten here, it's not just they didn't remember, but they've ceased to care. They don't care anymore. It's not important. His resting place is not important. So it's a challenge to us. What is it for you? See, why do you avoid quiet sorting out time with the Lord? Our first story marks the peak of Jesus' popularity. Uh, it goes downhill from here for Jesus. Not long after this, Jesus is going to spend most of his time with his followers, readying them for what is about to happen uh, in his death and resurrection and preparing them for the calling that, they will, that he has set before them. There's a few more popular moments, but not many. And apparently the people saw Jesus and his disciples leave. Mark tells us they went to Bethsaida. 
which would have been visible to the people from the shoreline. Here's a, here's a picture of the Galilee, and you can see that you can go from one point to another, and people could watch you leave in a boat. And we are told that the multitudes ran on foot from all the cities and actually arrived ahead of Jesus. And the word ran here means rushed along with others. And then that's how we should picture it. It's this multitude of people, crowds from different areas, and they're all rushing to get there. And they met the boat as it landed. Now, what was Jesus' reaction? Think about how your reaction might have been. You know, you're getting away. You plan to get away to a, to a deserted place, and you're pulling up to the shore, and there's multitudes of people waiting for you. See, the normal tendency would be, I know for me it would probably be, you know, a big sigh at first. Like, oh, you know, and, and then I thought, can't they just leave me alone for just a little while? Go away. Please go away. And I know sometimes when I have a full day and I start to feel like that, I'm worthless. And I have to say to the Lord, Lord, I'm losing my compassion. I need your compassion or I need to stop. And he's so good to fill me with caring even at the end of a day. So we in instead we see Jesus not saying those things, but we see his compassion again in Mark 6.34. It says, and Jesus, when he came out, saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion for them because they were like sheep, not having a shepherd. So he began to teach them many things. Now, those words are very similar to what we read in Mark 9 last week when he was seeing that harvest field being ripe and he was sending out his disciples. We've talked about how Jesus' compassion always moves him into action the perfect action, the most needed action from his point of view, not our point of view. And Jesus both healed the sick, we're told, and he taught them. And the challenge is, how, how do we, how do you handle interruptions? How do I handle them? See, it's in those times that it's so important to shoot up that arrow prayer and ask the Lord, what do you want me to do in this? Because, see, sometimes interruptions are divinely ordained. Yet sometimes they're not, and they're sent by the enemy of our souls to distract us from what God would have us do. And you and I rarely have the right perspective when a distraction comes, so we need to ask. See, because if we refuse those who come to us when God is in it, he's not going to be in our prayer time. But if we don't ignore distractions that are not sent by the Lord, we're going to miss out on some sweet time with him, and we will be ministering to them in our own strength. So that's important for us to know. When a distraction comes, Lord, what do you have for me to do here? Last week, we talked about God's kind of compassion. It's beyond what you and I in our flesh uh, can express, but because fleshly compassion often includes a personal need to fix someone's situation, a personal need to rescue them, or a desire to be liked. And see, God's compassion is moved simply by the person's need. And we can have that compassion if we seek his heart for this person and the situation. These people needed not only healing, but they needed truth. They needed a shepherd to guide them, not just feed them and heal them. He taught until the day was far spent. And the disciples reacted like you and I might have in verse 15. When it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, this is a deserted place. The hour is already late. Send the multitudes away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves food. Send them away, Jesus. You've been with them long enough. You've healed enough people, Jesus. Sometimes when we have suggestions like that for others, we, we've got to admit that we're the ones that are hungry and tired, you know, and, and we've got to look at our own hearts. And Jesus' first response was, they don't need to go away. He's looking at the need that they had being much greater than hunger. And then he said to them, you give them something to eat. 
And it was important that they learn that they didn't need Jesus' physical presence for Jesus to work. They didn't always need Jesus to directly do that. Jesus could work through them. And they needed to understand that because one day that's what they had. A good reminder to us too. And see, Jesus didn't turn a blind eye to their physical need. And sometimes we think that he's so about just our spiritual need that he doesn't consider our physical. So they had to, felt like they had to come alongside Jesus and say, hey, Jesus, did you notice they're hungry? Really? He knew, and he took care of it. Remember, they had just come back from healing people and casting out demons. They had personally witnessed the miraculous, but they forgot, and they simply considered their own resources and their excuse, we only have five loaves and two fish. And actually, they didn't have that. It was a little boy that had it. And it was probably his lunch that his mother packed. And they were ready to just take that from the little boy. But lest we be too quick to criticize, how many times have you experienced the work of God in your life? And when the next trial hits, you forget about his faithfulness and, and God's care and his provision seems to just slip your mind. And, and what do we say? Not this one. This trial's different. I think he's going to be different in this. I don't think he's going to come through for me in this one. And the disciples were kind of in that place. They'd seen great miracles, and yet they're doubting that Jesus can take care of these people. I think Jesus had them right where he wanted them. The realization of having got it, and I don't know where to get it. That's a good thing to admit. And then Jesus gave them another instruction. Bring them here to me. Bring what you have to me. See, that's all he asks of us. That's our part. What have you got? That's what he wants. Because our Jesus can do a lot with just a little. In verses 19 to 21, it says, Then he commanded the multitudes to sit down on the grass. And he took the five loaves and the two fish... And looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke and gave the loaves to his disciples. And the disciples gave to the multitudes. So they all ate and were filled. And this word fill is they are stuffed. Can't eat another bite of a fish. And they took up 12 baskets full of fragments, fragrant, fragments, excuse me, that remained. And now those who had eaten were about 5,000 men besides women and children. So probably at least 10,000 people. And I love 12 basketfuls remained for 12 disciples to pick up. And John closed the story with this statement, which helps us understand Jesus' next action. So the Gospel of John says this, Then those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said, This is truly the prophet who has come into the world. Therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. But before Jesus departed, look at verse 22 of Matthew 14. He immediately made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. See, it wasn't time for the multitudes to try to make him king. So what did he do? The first thing, before he got rid of the multitudes, he, put, he made his disciples get in a boat and said, go. Why? The disciples were just like the people. They wanted Jesus to be king too. And, and I think he was really protecting them, like, I don't want you getting sucked up into this, what the people are doing here. You go. So he sent them away to the other side where they would encounter a storm and the storm hit and they forgot all his promises again see whatever whatever God tells us to do he will be faithful to enable us to do it so he says go to the other side he won't tell us to go to the other side if he's not going to get us there I love when I can identify something in my life as sin I can't change my personality I can't change the way I look but if the Bible tells me this is wrong in God's eyes, I get excited because he can fix that. 
that can be changed. And that's so very exciting. Remember, the disciples weren't too much different than the multitudes. Very persuadable men. So he made them go away. And verse 23 tells us that Jesus finally got his quiet time. God is faithful to supply that time for us. Sometimes you and I have to be especially determined. You ever had those times where it's a busy morning and you, you were going to do your quiet time and then something happens and so you don't do it? And, and how many times you say, well, I was going to spend time with the Lord, but it didn't work out today. And you don't even think about maybe after dinner, maybe before you go to bed. It's just like, oh, the opportunity's gone. Jesus didn't see it that way. And he said, okay, now, now I can have my quiet time. And so we're told when evening had come, Jesus was alone there, disciples gone, multitudes gone. You know, that, ah, oh, quiet time. And Jesus, after the quiet time, and what's so good about our time with the Lord is he ministers to us, and then he says, okay, you ready to go? Get going again. And look at the first word of verse 24, but... We've all been there. But Jesus, that's all real nice. But there's a horrendous storm in my life right now. Are you aware of the storm, Lord? You sent me into a storm. And I don't have the resources to fight it. And you don't seem to be doing anything about it, Lord. So let's pick up the story in verse 24. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. And contrary is it was pushing them where they didn't want to go. And then in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it's a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. Jesus' prayer times often included praying about what was about to happen. What was about to happen was another storm. But this storm would affect their faith even more than that first storm at sea that they experienced, that one where Jesus was asleep in the boat. The disciples were on the verge of getting who Jesus is in a deeper way. The boat's in the middle of the sea. The middle of Galilee is probably two and a half miles, probably at that time because there was a lot more water then, about four miles would be about midpoint in the sea. If you go down in the middle of that sea, swimming to the shore amongst tumultuous waves just isn't going to happen. Mark tells us that Jesus saw them from the shore straining and rowing for the wind was against them. Jesus saw them. Now, you can see that you can see all the way across the Galilee on, on a clear day. This was night. This was a lot of waves. We don't know if, if man with our natural eyes could have been able to see them struggling in the middle of the sea or not. But Jesus did because our Jesus is El Roy. He's the God who sees, and he always, like compassion, he does something about what he sees, and he saw their struggle, and in his timing, he went to them. And Jesus, our John tells us that the sea arose because a great wind was blowing. Think of that phrase, the sea arose. That's a powerful phrase. See, I, I thought about seeing across the sea, and I thought, I can see pretty well when life is clear, when life is good, but I don't see well in the storms, but God does. He sees just as well in the storms as he does in clear days. Verse 25 says, now in the fourth watch of the night, between 3 and 6 a.m. Now, wait, they were in the middle of the sea in the evening, not until hours later, maybe 12 hours later, did Jesus come to them. And John wrote, it was already dark, and Jesus hadn't come to them. Oh, how many times you and I have had those kinds of thoughts. Lord, it's already dark. It's time for you to bail me out here. And Jesus hadn't come. 
it's already really bad, Lord. It's just going to get worse. Or how about this one in Mark's account of the first storm? What did they say to Jesus? Do you not care that we are perishing? See, we've all experienced those times in our life where we think, God, don't you care? Because nothing is happening in my life that is showing me that you care. Therefore, you must not care. Sometimes the Lord makes us wait. He allows things to get really scary in our lives, and he seemingly sleeps or ignores. At least he doesn't seem to be doing anything about it. I know in my life when I consider those times when it feels like he's, he's so far away, I realize I learned a lot during those times. And there's not a time when you look back and you don't say, wow, Lord, you did it just right. Your timing was just perfectly. But in the storm, it doesn't feel like that. And when they saw Jesus walking on the sea, Matthew says they were troubled. John says they were afraid. And look at what they supposed. It's a ghost. A belief at the time was the last thing that a sailor would see before drowning was a ghost. And they feel like they're going down and somebody's walking on the water. It must be a ghost. They were troubled, I bet. But this is probably not the only reason they were troubled. They were good Jewish boys. They knew the Old Testament. And the Old Testament scripture says, no one can see God and live. And they should have known this verse. He alone spreads out the heavens and treads, walks on the waves of the sea. God walks on the waves of the sea. And suddenly in the storm, they see this figure walking on the waves of the sea. Is it a ghost? Is it God? They don't want to see either one. They would not have had relief. They would have felt fear. I mean, you know, at that point, it's forget the perils of the storm. The waves don't matter. Somebody's walking on a sea, and I don't know how he's doing it. And he's walking right towards us. Immediately, Jesus talked with them, and he said to them, Be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. It is I. See, we've got to know the character of God when he says, Hey, it's me. You don't need to be afraid. We have to know that he's trustable. Then we can be stilled. In the midst of our struggle, the Lord tells us that he is with us and he's promised to never, ever leave us. And he says to us, I'm with you. What does that mean to you? Those words from the Lord are meant to calm us, but they will only do that if we know what he's like. And the disciples didn't yet know. Gnosko no, experientially no. They'd, they'd kind of watched him work miracles in other people's lives from afar, but they didn't personally, they hadn't experienced his personal touch in their lives. Jesus was telling them, do not be afraid. It's me. We probably all have some sort of memory as a, of a, being a child or seeing a child react in fear when, when uh, someone pops up and scares them. You know, and, and they freak, but, but what calms them? If it's someone they know, they go, whoa, 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 it's okay, it's me. And you watch the child just settle down. Oh, okay, I don't need to fear. And so Jesus is coming along in this time of great fear, just going, it's okay, it's me. Something happened that only Matthew recorded uh, between Jesus' statement to not be afraid and Jesus causing the wind to cease, and just as a sidelight, um, this story of the feeding of the 5,000, backing up a little bit, it's the only story that all four Gospels contain, and the story of the resurrection. So it's an important story, and it's followed by the story of the storm in Matthew and Peter walking on the sea water, and Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it's you, remember they, Jesus said, it's me. So Peter says, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. And so he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out saying, Lord, save me. 
And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and, and caught him. And he said, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And Jesus said to all of the disciples, it is I. Don't be afraid. But Peter, Peter said, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. And Peter knew that Jesus was fully capable of that kind of miracle. He knew that if Jesus called him, he would enable him. Peter was smart here. He didn't, unlike Peter's personality, he didn't just jump in the water and take that risk. He said, he was like, I want Jesus to call me to the water. Then I'm going to be okay. Important to remember, Jesus told Peter, come. So Peter did. And he jumped out of the boat and he walked on the water to go to Jesus then Peter saw. He saw that the wind was boisterous. A good definition of boisterous, he saw the wind was stronger than. It was stronger than him. Peter saw the wind is stronger than me. I'm going down. But he forgot it wasn't stronger than Jesus. And Peter began to sink. That's what we do, isn't it? We look at the circumstances and we see that they are boisterous, that they're stronger than us, and we emotionally sink in despair. And Peter was beyond trying to figure out what to do. It's good when we're in that place. So Peter cried out three simple words, Lord, save me. And we're told in verse 31, and immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him. And you know that feeling, you know, when you say, Lord, save me, Lord, help me. And, and we've experienced that time of God just gotcha. It's the best, isn't it? It's that wonderful feeling of, Lord, help me. And all of a sudden, he's got me. I know he's got me. And Peter got to experience that. And it changed everything for Peter. God knows exactly when it's best to rescue us immediately. Oh, to just imagine the feeling of Peter and even the feeling of Jesus, the, the joy knowing Peter's getting something right now. And the joy that he has with you and me when, when, when we get to that point of, she's getting something about me right now that she didn't get before. And he loves that sureness that Peter felt, the strength, the feeling of being safe. See, still raging. You know, the storm's still there. And very often we still have those storms in our lives, but God, Jesus says, I got you. Jesus had Peter, and that was enough for Peter. And then Peter, Jesus said to Peter, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? If Peter would have trusted, if the disciples had trusted, they would not have panicked or doubted the Lord. Jesus doesn't call us into a storm with the intention of letting us sink. Little faith forgets that. Also, when God's holding us in his arms and he's calmed us, we often look back at our lack of faith and we wonder ourselves, don't we? Why did I not trust him? We realize God knew what he was doing in the entire storm, the entire trouble. See, it wasn't the violence of the wind nor the raging of the waves that endangered Peter's life. It was his littleness of faith. Look at the words of verse 30. It was not the wind that caused Peter to sink. It was when he saw the wind that he became afraid that he became, began to sink. Apply this spiritually. See, it's not the trial in our life that will take us down. God has promised to be with us in the trials. It's our lack of faith, our lack of trusting the Lord in a trial that takes us down. And that's Satan's intention. He wants to take our faith down. He's after our faith, but always, always, when we call out to the Lord, save me, he will reach out his hand and keep us from sinking spiritually. Verse 32, when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Jesus could have calmed the wind first before he called Peter to come to him. You know, just made the sea all nice and flat. Okay, now, I got it all calmed down now, Peter. Come on out. 
But he didn't. He let the waves rage. He chose to call him in the storm while the sea was raging. Now the disciples' reaction to it all, this is what they said after the first storm. Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? And now look at verse 33, what their reaction was. Truly, you are the son of God. That first storm, they started the question, okay, who is this that the wind and the sea obey? And then Jesus takes them to a deeper place, another storm, and their reaction is, truly, you are the son of God. They got it. They not only understood Jesus' power, they understood who he was. And we've got to know both if we're going to learn to be still. Mark's account closes with, this statement after stating that they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure and they marveled and then it said, for they had not understood about the loaves because their heart was hardened. Back to that miracle of the loaves and the fish. Now the interaction that Jesus was working for, he's, he's working towards this in what we will see in John 6. Understanding the miracle of the loaves and the fish the miracle of the loaves and fish seemed to have made no lasting impression on the disciples. Their hearts were hardened, which just means that their hearts hadn't been affected by the miracle that they saw. We're told in John's gospel that the next day, the people who had been following Jesus, many of whom he had fed and healed, discovered that he was gone, and they got in their boats and went to the other side to find him. See, they're on a high. You know, they just experienced being fed from just a few loaves of bread and some fish. It's kind of like a retreat high. We just were at a retreat a week and a half ago. A lot of you were there, and you know what a retreat high is, especially Saturday night. We experience God working, and we make all these commitments to the Lord on Saturday night. You know, you that are married, you say, I'm going to be nice to my husband from here on out. I'm going to submit every single time. And that sin, it's gone. In fact, Lord, I'm never going to sin again. You know, and we just get so wrapped up and Jesus just take me. But see, if it's not a, a commitment provoked by the Holy Spirit and surrendered to the Holy Spirit, it fades away. And they're in that place of, Wow. We really like what Jesus did when he fed us. I want more of this. So they follow him. They'd been fed food without even having to work for it. They liked that. It was then that Jesus' message challenged them. They didn't get the miracle of the loaves and the fish either. And he reminded them how they were looking to him as their ancestors looked to Moses. You just want the physical care. You just want bread for your body. And Jesus told them that he's the bread from heaven. He's the bread of life. In his challenges further on in the chapter, uh, we are told that many walked away that day. They wanted what Jesus could give them spiritually, and they were interested in nothing more than that. And Jesus turned to his disciples, and he asked, do you also want to go away? Do you also want to leave me? And it was Peter that had the answer. He said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. We will, Lord willing, uh, go into this more in depth when we get back together again in September if, if the Lord hasn't come back for us. And, uh, but it's, it's nice to see, when did Peter come up with that answer? You are the Christ, the son of the living God. The night before, the night before when he called out to Jesus and he said, Lord, save me. And Jesus did. And Peter had gone from watching Jesus rescue and heal and feed others to experiencing Jesus saving him. And that made all the difference. The difference of Jesus personally touching Peter. Oh, 
I can almost feel the joy in, in Jesus' heart when Peter said those words. Peter not only knew Jesus' power, he knew his word was faithful. He personally knew Jesus, and that's what he, Jesus wants from us. He wants relationship. That's what he's after. Faith believes God's power and his word and acts accordingly, and relationship is a result of that. Peter could now boldly declare, he saved me. And therefore, Peter knew there was not only nowhere else he would go, there was nowhere else he wanted to go. Jesus had the words of eternal life. The son of the living God had saved Peter. Psalm 94, 18 says, if I say my foot slips, your mercy, O Lord, will hold me up. Now we move to John 6, and I did something this morning that was very helpful, and it was this. Stand up and stretch. Just kind of, don't talk to each other, because then I'll lose you. Just kind of stretch, because Kathy's got one more part of the message to do, and it's nighttime, and you're tired. All right, feel good? <laughs> Just so-so? <laughs> All right. Please be seated, and we'll turn to John 6, and we'll see John's account of what happened next. John tells us that immediately the boat was at the land where they were going. The lesson was learned for them. There was no need to keep them out in a raging sea any longer. On their own, it would have taken a long time to get halfway across to Galilee, but with Jesus in the boat, seconds. When the people found Jesus, he was on the other side of the lake with the disciples. But the people knew he didn't get in the boat with the disciples. We didn't see him get in a boat. So they asked him the question, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus didn't answer their question. It didn't matter. What mattered to him and what should have mattered to them was the condition of their hearts. So he answered them in verse 26, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. You know, what a sad statement. In other words, they were about having their stomachs filled, not their hearts. See, none of us here can claim that we've never had those thoughts. People are more attracted to material things than they are to spiritual things. If I set out a sign and a table on this side of our parking lot and said, free food and free money, and over here, free spiritual truths, the, the key to eternal life. Which line do you think would be longer? Isn't that sad? It would be this one, wouldn't it? We were like, money, free money? Wow. And that's where these people were at. Free bread that I don't have to work for? Wow, I want that. People are more attracted to filling their stomach than filling their heart. Jesus had proven that. Just like Moses fed the people manna in the wilderness, Jesus could feed the people of God. He was fully able to do that. And there was a common expectation of the Jews at that time that the Messiah is going to restore the provision of manna. So it must, he must be the one. He's going to feed us. If we come to Jesus thinking that the best he has to offer is loaves of bread or physical relief, we won't understand him. And we will think he's failed us the first time we hunger or there isn't bread in our cupboard. Last week I was reading about those who were left in Jerusalem after Babylon conquered the city. And they, they weren't quite sure what to do. They had very little resources of their own. So they thought maybe going back to Egypt would be a good alternative. So they went to the prophet Jeremiah, and they said, will you go seek the Lord? And we promise we will do whatever the Lord tells us to do. So Jeremiah says, okay. Ten days later, the Lord spoke to Jeremiah, and Jeremiah spoke the words of God to the people, telling them, do not go to Egypt. So we find in Jeremiah 43, 7, their response so they went to the land of Egypt, for they did not obey the voice of the Lord. 
look at their reasoning or listening, listen to their reasoning in um, Jeremiah 44, verses 17 and 18. But we will certainly do whatever has gone out of our own mouth to burn incense to the queen of heaven and pour out drink offerings to her as we've done. We and our fathers, our kings and our princes in the cities of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem. For then we had plenty of food. We were well off and saw no trouble. But since we stopped burning incense to the queen of heaven and pouring out drink offerings to her, we've lacked everything and have been consumed by the sword and by famine. In other words, it didn't pay to serve God. So we're going to do whatever we feel like doing. A man has not changed. Jesus used some words in this portion of John 6 that are very important to him. And one of them is seek. Why we seek him is so important to him. Just like us, Jesus doesn't like being used. He wants us to come to him for his sake, not for ours, for who he is, not for what he does. We see his sadness in verses like Psalm 106, 12 to 14. Then they believed his words, and this is talking about Israel. After, after the Red Sea was opened, they, all of a sudden he does this miracle. And it says, then they believed him, and they sang his praise, but they soon forgot his works. They did not wait for his counsel, but lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tested God in the desert. Look at Ezekiel 33, 31. God says to Ezekiel, so they come to you as people do. They sit before you as my people and they hear your words, but they do not do them. For with their mouth, their mouth they show much love, but their hearts pursue their own gain. And yet God encourages us to seek him, but with the right heart. You know, in Jeremiah 29, 13, and you will seek me, and find me when you search for me with all your heart. And you have several scriptures about the importance and the value that God places on it when we seek him with the right heart. Verse 27 of John 6, Jesus continued to say, Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because the Father has his seal on him. Now, the word labor is translated as work in verse 28, so let's substitute it here. Do not work for the food that perishes, but work for food which endures to everlasting life. And then they said to him, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? And we're still asking that question, aren't we? We so often forget and we place expectations on others and on ourselves, and we think God's the same as everyone else is. Work. Do something, and that will cause you to gain favor with God. See, yes, we know salvation is by grace, by faith alone, not of works. But then we so often move into thinking we can please God by different behaviors that we do, that we can gain his favor by that. Work's done in our own strength and our own determination. And the Galatian Christians were like that, and Paul challenged them, or probably better to say he rebuked them, he reprimanded them. And it says in Galatians 3.3, 3, he said to them, are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit? You got saved by the work of the Spirit. Do you now think you're going to be made perfect by the works of your flesh? See, to the Jews, obtaining eternal life and consisted in finding the right formula for performing the right works to please God. And they're asking Jesus, just tell us what to do, and we'll do it, because that's what their religious leaders did. They gave them a bunch of rules, and, and not only you have to perform all this that, that God has said to gain favor with him, but then they made hundreds of their own rules. And it was like, the more rules you follow, the better it gets, so we'll just keep on making rules. How sad. So they come to him like, What's your rule, Jesus? And Jesus has another important word. He says, I'm looking for a broken and a contrite heart. Contrite. 
We rarely, if at all, use the word contrite in our conversations. Anybody use the word contrite this week or month? We, we don't use it most of the time. We, we don't like it. We've been told it's a bad word to be contrite. It's weakness, but it's an important word to the Lord. And I think it can be best understood by looking at its opposites. Opposites of contrite, unrepentant, and penitent, remorseless, unapologetic. If we remove the first two letters of most of that wor those words and the less and remorseless and replace it with full, we get the meaning of contrite. It's repentant. It's penitent. It's remorseful. It's apologetic. God loves that. Consider God's perspective in these verses. I just want to soak you in four of them. Psalm 34, 18, the Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and save such as have a contrite heart. Psalm 51, 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise or look down on or think little of. Isaiah 57, 15, for thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy I dwell in the high and holy place. Who does he dwell with? With him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. And then Isaiah 66 too. For all those things my hand has made and all those things exist, says the Lord. But on this one will I look, on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit. Do we understand how sweet these words are to the Lord? How can I ever work the works of God to gain eternal life? Can't. Tell me, how can I work for the food which endures for everlasting life? They were asking that. How do I, we like, we like this free food. We like this daily food. Now you're saying you'll give us some kind of food that we can live forever. What do we have to do to get that? And he's pulling them from their reasoning to spiritual thinking because he says, this is the work God's looking for. This is the work of God that you believe in him whom I sent. And they tended to avoid spiritual thinking. Pastor Dale talked about uh, believing this past Sunday, believing faith, the kind of believing that God on, not only desires, but he requires of us. It's a trusting. It's a dependency. It's not accepting Jesus as a historical figure who died on the cross. All we've got to do to believe that is to open up some secular history books, and they will say there was a man named Jesus who walked the earth, who was crucified and buried. It's not in believing that Jesus performed miracles or taught good things. It's not accepting just the fact that Jesus is the son of God. We've seen in previous studies that the demons boldly declare Jesus is the son of the most high. He's the son of God. Demons declare that and they're going to hell. Is it not in what his, it's not in what history's declared or what man has declared, or what demons have declared. It's what Jesus has declared. And he said, I came to save sinners. And he proved it by his death and his burial and his resurrection. And that's crucial to believing. It's in believing that Jesus and Jesus alone is as he declared about himself. He declared, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. No one can get to the Father by me. If we believe Jesus, then we've got to believe that statement. Sound narrow? <laughs> it's a way to escape. It's a way to heaven. May we, we love it. How can we know we're doing the right thing in trusting Jesus? The Bible says so. But, but how do we know? And that was a question I had almost 50 years ago before I came to the Lord. It was like, will somebody tell me this Jesus is worth sinking my life into? Because I don't want to be a fool. 
And I thought I actually wanted just some man or some pastor to come to me and say, it's all true. All you got to do is believe it. But then I realized in my little analytical mind, you know, whatever man said wasn't enough. It had to be the Holy Spirit to quicken it to my heart. So how can we know? Look at verse 27, the phrase followed by the word because. Because God the Father has set his seal on him. God the Father has endorsed Jesus. When John the Baptist baptized Jesus, and he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Look at him. He's here. Heaven endorsed Jesus with these words. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And then while on the Mount of Transfiguration, we have in Matthew 17, 15, again, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. Hear everything he said. Believe everything he said. Trust in everything he has said. I'm going to date myself, but years ago, many products boasted that they had the good housekeeping seal of approval. And when you saw that, it was like, this is the product I want. If it doesn't have that seal, and, and this one does, I'm buying this one. I trust this one. It's, this is saying this product is everything it's, it's presented to be. And we go for it. And we have Jesus saying he has the seal of the Father. Jesus has been endorsed by the Father. And the Father calls us to put our hope and our confidence for forgiveness and eternal life in Jesus See, there's no one so good that doesn't need to be saved, and there's no one so bad that can't be saved. Jesus declared that. Now, when I, let me give you one more here. John 6, 40. This is the will of him who sent me. In other words, Jesus is stating, this is the will of the Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life and I will raise him up at that last day. This is what the Father wants. This is my son. I'm pleased in him. I'm pleased in everything he's done. Hear him. When I realized that these verses would be the last verses of our study, I, I had a little conversation with the Lord, like this is really dumb, Lord, to stop right in the middle of a story because Jesus is going to continue talking to the people. You know, the people are going to leave. There's a lot that's going to happen and I thought that was a weird way to stop but uh, we're in this season right now where a lot of TV programs are at that place too you know we last few weeks have been season finales and what do most season finales have cliffhangers and so this is going to be our cliffhangers we're going to move from Jesus being very very popular to the multitudes to turning to training his disciples and us, getting them ready for his suffering, but also getting them ready to serve. So I'm excited, so stay tuned. <laughs> Will you pray with me? Father, thank you. I, I think of cliffhangers, and uh, Lord, we, we are left with, we don't know if something bad will happen or something good will happen, but Lord, your cliffhangers, we, we know. You can't do anything but good. That's who you are. You're holy. You're perfect. You're the mighty, awesome God. And we get to be yours. And we, we so thank you. We worship you. Lord, would you touch any part of our lives that has been seeking you for the wrong reasons? Because, Lord Jesus, we really do just want you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.